Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Uh, this is a show about uh, Gnosticism, the esoteric, uh, esoteric and uh, whatever I'm interested in this week. Uh, we've done a lot of programming on Rosicrucianism. We've done a lot on the history of Rosicrucianism. We've done a lot on Rosicrucian books and ideas, but we haven't quite done enough on what do Rosicrucians do? Uh, and um, we're welcoming back to the show Sam Robinson. Hi, Sam. And we have uh, Ian Gladwell, uh, who is the translator, author, editor of Letters on the Royal Art, The Spiritual Alchemy of J.P. Kerning's Esoteric Masonry. We're, we're going to be talking about, uh, well, I just said esoteric masonry. We're going to be talking about uh, J.P. Kerning. We're going to be talking about the book. We're going to be talking about a specific technique that uh, Kerning taught that's been adopted by many Rosicrucian groups and uh, many other groups. We, we have talked about this a, a little bit before. I, I will link those previous shows with Sam in the show notes, so go down and listen to to those as well and i'm really bad at introductions brothers i'm uh uh I, you know I, I always just want to get right into the show you know people know what a podcast is they can guess what the show is about from the name so maybe we'll just launch right in uh ian can you, can you tell us who was uh johan baptist krebs i'm sure i didn't say that right aka jb kerning so jb kerning um was a mystic philosopher, a mason, and a writer who appeared in the 19th century. Uh, he was, as a mason, he was a, the worshipful master of his lodge for up to 30 years. So that could attest to his experience and knowledge of masonry. It was, um, you could say, secondhand nature to him um, to, to operate within that world. Uh, he himself, he, he was an opera singer. Um, he started singing at a very young age, um, and uh, when he was uh, welcomed into uh, an opera for, for the royal court um, as a tenor singer, and he was a singer throughout his life, he was a mason throughout his life, somewhere in the midst of all this, he develops his own mystical method of alphabet magic. Uh, so the question is, where does this come from? Where, what are his influences? And, you know, what world does this come out of? Uh, we could, we have a few ideas of some of his influences. Uh, we can't say exactly where he got his alphabet system from. It seems for the most part to be something that he made up on his own. He likely had influences from sources like Kabbalah. Uh, we know that, you know, texts such as the Bhagavad Gita were around, so he may have been familiar with yoga, Eastern type of yoga to an extent, but none of that, I think, is fleshed out enough to prove as, a, you know, a real source for his mysticism. Um, he, he comes with a background um, from a... a is a pedagogue, uh, say, he's like a, his name was uh, Pestalozzi. And he, uh, in fact, came up with this education system uh, at the end of the 1700s, early 1800s, and was really trying to find a way to teach kids methods of education. Um, and the approach that he took was very naturalistic. And the reason why I mention Pestalozzi is because uh, Kerning actually taught a music institute using Pestalozzi's methods. So we know that his influence from Pestalozzi is real and it came from there. Um, and it's especially important, I think, in the context of talking about uh, Pestalozzi's approach to, the, I would say it's like a naturalistic approach towards learning, which was based from his point of view, was based should be based on experience. You know, one doesn't start with theory necessarily. One starts with just learning firsthand. You know, you do the work, you learn out in nature, you 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 practice things, and that's how you learn them. And so, for Kerning, in the context of his music uh, pedagogy, this becomes really important. And you know, as terms of his method, one suspects or one tends to think that this that area in particular since his system of mysticism is based on 
letters, i.e. vowels and consonants, that his singing experience was somehow informative to his system of mysticism. Um, but, you know, as far as the origins we, of, of his system, we pretty much have to speculate what, what the origins were. They are pretty much seem to be just from Kerning. You know, he drew his influences together and somehow through his career as a Mason, a singer and a mystic, he was, you know, he read a lot of philosophy. He was very well read in, in many different areas um, and was considered authoritative in those areas as well. Um, that, that he distilled whatever experience and influence he's had into, into this practical system. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can tell just from uh, from the book that he's he's incredibly well read and uh, the origins of the system. You know, I, I do find that that question interesting because I'm sure you've had conversations with people. The, the technique is is similar, reminiscent of techniques that are that are found in wisdom uh, lineages all around the world. Right. There, there's certain Buddha, Buddhist techniques that it reminds me of, um, specifically with letters. Uh, there's uh, the, even ancient Gnostic techniques with uh, the so-called uh, Marcus the Magician. Uh, uh, and I, I wonder. Sometimes you do find this when when you're looking at the world's wisdom traditions. That you know, maybe there's a secret brother out, a brotherhood out there, uh, uh, planting this stuff all around. Or instead, perhaps because this this stuff works, or it's real, or it somehow has a resonance with the human mind and the human experience. It, it just keeps coming up again and again. Uh, people are are always going to be rediscovering it, rediscovering forms of it, putting it together. But but as you said, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. Nowhere he he did uh, uh, his many influences uh, have come together. And um, in, in the book, there's there's quite a lot about how to form vowels and consonants with the mouth. There's diagrams. I, I think obviously his his singing instruction must have influence on there. You know, I, I did um, speech uh, therapy, or, or as I like to call it, speech therapy. As as a as a child, right? So the the moving around of the tongue, the the shape of the mouth, uh, which is uh, not taught to us when when we learn language, uh, is is obviously uh, I think coming from from a, a, from a pedagogy, right? Um, but uh, uh, the, the next question is it's called letters on the royal art. Um, what are the letters on the royal art? Like who were they written to, and why were they written? So the letters were written. Um from Kerning to a friend of his, uh, Franz, Franz Josef Molitor. And Molitor was a, uh, a fellow Mason. He was a Kabbalist. Uh, and he was a Kabbalist who history treats as, you know, he learned from the Jewish tradition. He wasn't just, you know, studying Christian Kabbalah or something like that. Like he, he was present and around uh, the Jewish tradition. Um, I think uh, Gershom Sholem mentions him in a few places too, and may have written written some authoritative uh, work on on him. So you get the impression through these letters, which you know I haven't yet seen any of Molitor's responses, so I don't know what what's contained to, in them. But um, what you get the impression is that you know these are two friends; they're very friendly in these letters. Um, and you can see that through the way that Kerning addresses him as his friend and the bond that they share over, um, you know, sharing knowledge and conversations and things like that. Um, you get the impression that Molitor, as a Kabbalist and Kerning may have at some point gotten to a discussion about, you know, what is, you know, what is Kabbalah? I mean, Kabbalah itself has its own oral tradition. And within the oral Kabbalah, within certain streams, if you, you know, go looking deep enough, has similar approaches towards uh, letter permutations, perhaps the way that certain, uh, you know, the vowels and, and things are spoken. I mean, I'm thinking about like uh, Abulafia or something like that. Um, there's certainly that type of thing happening within Kabbalah as well. So, like I said, you get the impression that Molitor and Kerning are having this discussion, and Kerning is sort of telling his friend, "Well, yeah, that's that's Kabbalah, but you know, this is this is like the original Kabbalah because he explains this to his friend in letters, like in various places. For Kerning, Kabbalah is this very—it's a primitive sort of like uh, art." That, that, that precedes even language, you know? Um, and this goes 
back to his ideas about Pestalozzi, you know, like you, and as you said, you know, you're experiencing things in the body, you know, these are like universal ideas. These are universal concepts that could be picked up and found in various places. So throughout the letters, these are instructions that Kerning is giving to his friend. And, you know, there's, so in that sense, there's a certain level of intimacy. There's a certain, um, expectation, obviously, that his friend is knowledgeable about Freemasonry because he's, you know, he's not candid about sharing details about rituals and all these, these aspects that are taking place in the lodge. Um, and, and then, you know, he goes on to give him full instructions in the letter. So they're really quite, um, they're really quite interesting in that sense, you know, because even though they're written as personal letters to his friend, you know, because he's so thorough about explaining himself and explaining his method and his ideas, that's why I think they work so well just for anyone, you know, to read them because they, it's, it is, you know, even though he's speaking to someone who's familiar with Freemasonry and though half of the book is describing things in a Masonic context, the other half is really, you know, providing instructions and, um, you know, sort of like keys to working with the vowels and consonants that anyone I think could pick up on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I do highly recommend, you know, chances are if you're already listening or watching the show, you're going to love the book. It, it, it's relatively short, but as you said, it's 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 very thorough. Um, it's it's very dense. It's very deep. I shouldn't say dense. It's it's a good read. It's it's a good read. Uh, something that I really liked about it, Ian. Something that I really liked uh, about this work from Kerning and. Um, yeah, I don't want to speak for for Sam, but but I feel like he's maybe expressed this this frustration before. But I feel like a lot of people come to the Western esoteric tradition and they want to become wizards, they want to become ascended masters, they want to become living gods. And there's a real holiness in these le in these letters, right? Uh, a real a real instructions about how how to become holy, how to become a holy being. And I, I really appreciated that. And that kind of leads to my next question. Why, why did you think it was important to, to translate and publish them? Well, I mean, for the past three or four years um, or more, you know, folks like Sam and others have been, you know, talking about the Kerning work. Um, and since, you know, it was revealed, uh, you know, some, I don't know how many years ago now it's been, that you know, Kerning was in fact behind many of the practices um, that are sort of foundational for the, you know, the at least, you know, the modern Western esoteric current, um, particularly through the figure uh, Alois Mylander, that Kerning's uh, teachings were fun, were foundational for, for that. Um, and in fact, you know, we've come to learn that many, uh, of the early 20th century groups, um, theosophists and, and many others were in fact, not only reading people who were influenced by Kerning, such as, you know, being taught directly by Mylander, that they were reading his, his works directly. So I think, you know, there's, there's two points here, of course, that are important. One is the historic component of it, which is you get to see the origins of these ideas, which for me are like quite revealing because you get to see them in their original form. You know, this is like ground zero for this kind of work. But of course, the other part of it is like as a living practice in and of itself, which I think is the work that, you know, we're trying to, to, keep, to keep going. And this is what I think Sam is invested in. Um, quite directly as well with his his books on Mylander and some of the future works that he's going to be publishing. Yeah, exactly. I, I should probably add a few things there. I mean, Ian's brought up so many interesting points. So when he's talking about these letters and he asked about, you know, what are the essence of these letters? One thing to bear in mind is Koenig's really talking about esoteric masonry and he's saying these are the keys of masonry. And I think one thing Freemasons can appreciate from this book is that he's talking about masonry from within the context of the rituals and masonry itself. Whereas when a lot of, let's say different organizations study esoteric Freemasonry in commerce, um, in quotation marks, well, what, what they're often doing is patching things from, you know, external systems. 
and bringing in external stuff to interpret masonry. So um, you can see that with the book on Memphis Miserium by um, Matt Rivagna, it was a really good book. And he's showing, okay, a lot of Memphis Miserium groups, actually Scottish right, and already um, so many groups bring in sort of, you know, Egyptian mythology and, and patch in a ton of stuff. You know, of, of course, in masonry, there's alchemical symbolism and so on. But um, some groups go to such, you know, extremes to, to load all the stuff that's in masonry, but, um, you know, to somehow make it more potent or more occult. But actually, Kearney's just looking at exactly what's in there. And he's saying, you know, through these Masonic signs, you know, you're not just opening up, um, um, you know, the keys to the brotherhood, you're also opening up the inner temple of man. And through these keys and signs that are Masonic, you can open up this lost word in yourself. So um, I think that's important to bear in mind, just for esoteric masonry, because th this is well before, you know, the, the, the later occult revival. Yeah. You know, there was already this oral tradition going on. And um, when Ian's, you know, talking about these other groups that were using kerning, um, you know, especially the early 1900s and so on, that we, we have um, acquired so many variations of the kerning technique. You know, the theosophists got in there. They joined it together with yoga, kundalini, and stuff like that. But the list of the orders is, you know, astounding. I mean, we 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 know that the OTO were doing it. Okay, so a lot of people, okay, you associate it with Crowley. I'm talking about the OTO before he took it over, you know, with Theodore Royce, what were they doing in the early days? Carl Kellner, he was the founder of the OTO with Royce, and Carl Kellner was a student of Mylander. So, okay, they get an old tradition of coning there. Rudolf Steiner, he takes up coning as well. Um, in many ways, in, including his um, eurythmy, his letter movements and dancing, he's channeling the currents of the letters into the body that way, um, and, and using the occult techniques in his in his own miserium, right? You know, Masonic order. You've got um, other pansophic orders that later spring up, like Trankers. Um, one going today is um, um, the pansophic order of Manninger, that's in um, Austria. They're using tons of kerning techniques to this day. Um, Franz Baron, obviously, that's a big name everybody knows. People, you know, don't associate his third book on the Kabbalah really with Kerning, because on one side he's rejecting Kerning, but actually he is teaching Kerning, you know, at the same time. Um, so it's foundational to all these guys. Um, from, from, from Steiner, Robert Falcon gets hold of it. So he's from the Stella Meditina side of the Golden Dawn. Then it becomes a standard teaching in the outer order of the Golden Dawn. Um, through developing the letters in the body. And then all of a sudden, um, in, in the inner order of the GD, they have something like Mylander's baptism of the blood, the building of the pentagram in the body, and so on. And Dion Fortune actually gets Falcon's copy. She was, you know, a member of his Stella Bellatina. Mm -hmm. um, and the list goes on, especially in England. So um, until it was 2015, I started to sort of show people, you know, what I found. And, and it sort of exploded from there. And, and what I appreciate this most of all is that it's almost like Koenig had the foresight to predict what would be an enduring system. You know, alchemy, you know, having to build up a whole laboratory, have all this stuff, the resources, the finances, um, to have a real laboratory, it, it, it's almost exhausting, you know. Um, also, Kabbalah, it's so in depth, you have to dedicate your whole life, it's very complex. Um, you know, systems like the GD, it is a life path, whereas, you know, and you can boil all that complex stuff down to its bare bones, you, you end up with something like coding. And, and ultimately, it is a form of internal alchemy meditation that sounds quite basic in practice, but it's very rich, very potent. So this, this really is a system that comes out of, you know, the end of the era of the great orders, you know, like the Asiatic, Asiatic Brethren, Golden Rose and Kweiser, and all of a sudden, we have this thing that was built to last, now busy society today, this is, you know, no matter how busy you are, this is a system that people can actually do. That's why I like it so much. Um, yeah, just wanted to share that thought. Oh, yeah, thank you. And I'm glad that you pointed out that, that it's a system that anybody can do because so much of, um, even, even some Christian mysticism, right? But particularly the, the forms of meditation that people are familiar with, you know, they're kind of yanked out of, 
Buddhism, but specifically uh, Buddhism from the monasteries, right? They're, they're not techniques for householders. And this is, you know, the Kerning is, is a working guy writing letters to another working guy. Uh, these are uh, people who have day-to-day -day lives. And this is a technique for people who have day-to-day -day lives. So I'm really glad that you that you brought that up. And, and you don't need any special... Um, uh, special gear and the technique itself. Well, I shouldn't say the technique itself. I guess there is a, the specific kerning version, but uh, and there's all these uh, mutations and interesting uh, variations on it. But it is, at the end of the day, relatively simple, right? What would you say? I would. I would say it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's it's there's more depth to it than probably appears at the surface. I would say. Um, you know, I'm I'm not just a translator of kerning. I've been practicing it as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's straightforward enough. And I think that because it's basically just doing with the faculties of every human being that it is, it is universal in that sense. Um, I, I will say though, that because I'm also doing work in the area of the Golden Rosenkreuze and exploring their practical alchemy that I find many, many correspondences, um, and not, not just, you know, imaginary correspondences, but systematic correspondences between Kerning's progress of development and, you know, a grade structure such as theirs, where, where one starts to even wonder, you know, how much was he actually informed of, of those types of practices because they just, they dovetail together in a, in a really nice way. And he obviously, you know, he he gives certain hints in his letters that he is aware of, of alche alchemical language and, and lingo um, to the degree that you know that he probably knows a little bit more than, than he's letting on. So simple, yes, but I think there's enough, enough depth there to last a long time in terms of like practicing it directly because... Um, as you see in the book, he, he lays out um, a system based on the three uh, Blue Lodge grades of Freemasonry. So there's a certain time expectation involved with each stage. Obviously, there's certain practices that he's um, sort of designating to each of those levels. There's divisions of bodies that, that are happening in those three degrees. And um, it's for the practitioner to to get in there and really to try it out um you know but the question becomes at that point you know how much can someone you know go all the way with the system without a little bit of guidance and for that i'll say that the more you go back and read the book and you see you know kerning sort of subtle comments about certain things they may not make sense the first or two reads but you go back later and you'll say ah that's that's what he was talking about. You know, he, he does give certain hints that often don't make sense until, well, you're ready to understand them, I would say. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm not a Mason, but I, I'm pretty familiar with, with a lot of Masonic material just from, from research because of my interest in the history of the modern Gnostic Church, right? You, you have to uh, go through Masonry to get there. Uh, I have a strong interest in Martinism. Again, you, you really can't, uh, if you're really going to dive into and research Mar Martinism, uh, you're going to have to become familiar with uh, with a lot of Masonic material. Uh, and, I, and I just have an interest in Memphis Misrium. But, but all that said, and you've basically kind of answered this question, but you know, the book is is impressive in I would say they're almost impossible layers of Masonic symbolism, like from tracing boards to the, the word grips and signs to even items that are present in the lodge are, are tied in with, with the technique. So does one need to be a Mason to really, really practice the technique and, and understand it, at least in this this specific kerning form, the, the original form? Well, I'm sure different people are going to have different opinions on that. Um, I suspect the more involved and familiar you are with, with Masonic symbolism, the more comfortable you're going to be with what he's talking about, or at least you're going to be familiar with what he's talking about. Uh, I mean, obviously the book is presented as esoteric masonry and he's descri describing these processes in that context to a friend who's a fellow Mason. Um, but having, but that having been said, I think that on the other hand, um, you know, that's, that's about half the book, you know, and the other half of the book is really getting into the, the technique itself, 
uh, and you know how how to practice it, his his ideas about what's going on during that process, um, both literally, figuratively, and you know mystically. Um, so, yeah, I would say yes and no. <laughs> That's probably the best answer to that question. Um, I don't know what are your thoughts, Sam. Yeah, I mean, but one thing we should bear in mind is when we talk about Koenig's original system, he had two systems. Okay, so he has this Masonic version, which I've outlined in my um, upcoming book about Koenig and Mylander. This Masonic version, he, is intent, he does intend this to be for Masons, but it's quite clear that, you know, after his time, a lot of non-Masons were practicing it. Um, how successful they are, I, I can't really say. I mean, um, but on the other side, during his own lifetime, he, he gave a public version. You know, that's the version Mylander takes up, and we call it now the Rosicrucian version. And um, that one, you know, he, he removes all the need for Masonic signs, and he's still working on the torso, still sinking into the body. Instead of using the letters and, and the Masonic cutting signs to open the torso, he's, he's using the Lord's Prayer in the public one, um, and you descend and achieve the baptism that way. So, but having said that, in both systems, you know, there are um certain things that belong to both so you know Koenig in both say in both versions he says you know you have to experience the life and and passion and um suffering and rebirth of Christ you know as a bodily experience not just in terms of a Christ consciousness you know where you just suddenly have this kind of knowing of things but actually um bodily uh, revelations happen, signs in the body, uh, according to my land, even, you know, certain signs on the skin. So um, all, all, all this comes into play. So there, there isn't just uh, one version. And when you look at both, well, um, th this really enriches the whole experience because you're not stuck with just one thing. Right, right. Well, uh, Sam, maybe you, you can tell us a, a little bit uh, about some of the other groups using it. And uh, I have here in my notes that, that you want us to talk about the Memphis Miserium and, and the famous Archaeum Acanorum. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about, about that? Right. So um, just about these groups. So just, just briefly, when, when I say um, Falcon and the GD had it, they got it from Steiner. Okay. The Steiner version, um, one of the things I was um, telling your mate today is um, he, he had access to all the different versions of Koenig, like I do today, actually. It probably hasn't happened for a long time, um, you know, for years. Steiner had access to, you know, um, the one that included um, sexual regeneration, you know, the, the raising of the internal currents. He had access to the Kundalini, Kundalini slash Chakra version. You know, he's using, because uh, he, he was connected to Friedrich Eckstein, who was my lender student. At the same time, he is talking about other occult orders. And when you read his text, it's not really clear unless you know those orders and you have those teachings and you say, oh, he's actually referencing all these other groups. So for a, today's Anthropos office, it's not clear. So that's one thing that's going to um, come about. We're going to reveal a whole ton of groups, but because of Steiner, and I have a love-hate relationship with him, everybody knows this, um, because, you know, he gets pretty funky and weird sometimes, but then he says some quite brilliant things too at the same time, and and he is very pansophical and has an outward view on humanity, just like Koenig would have, so I appreciate that, and where I will give Koenig, uh, um, Steiner credit is um, he, he's actually the first one to talk about um, Cagliostro's regeneration. Okay, so Cagliostro has what's called his quarantines, one's, one's called the morale regeneration, where you achieve a kind of um, second state of, of Adam, rest, you know, restore the fallen Adam, and achieve some sort of lost innocence and conversation with angels and um, the reception of a, of a pentagon, a holy seal and character from God. It's not only given to you on, on, a, on a pentagon, but it's inscribed into your soul. It's, it's an experience and you become morally pure so Cagliostro has that. And then Cagliostro has a second operation where he undergoes another quarantine. You take these alchemical drops, you know, Cagliostro is talking all kinds of stuff like your teeth fall out, your hair fall out. But if you take these drops, you'll live for another, what is it, 50 years? And according to him, yeah, you do this every 50 years. And, 
you know, <laughs> young forever. Yeah, so people people know about these quarantines if you know Kelly Yostra. But um, what's interesting about Steiner, he is the first one to actually talk about Cagliostro's quarantines as an internal experience, internal alchemy. Mm. Okay, so when he talks about the achieving the Pentagon, Stein is literally in his Memphis Mystery and Ritual, the Egyptian Rite of Masonry, which mm. claims roots to Cagliostro. And in that rite, he is literally pe getting people to work with the Kerning method using the pentagram in the body. Okay, and he's using this pentagram to achieve not only Mylander's baptism of blood, but the morale regeneration, okay, and, and to build, he talks about achieving new spiritual bodies through the Pentagon, and um, um, the hexagon is his philosopher's stone, okay, and again, that's worked on the body in his kerning version, he actually didn't come up with that himself um, in terms of working the, the hexagon and Pentagon um, in the body, that's from um, um, the sovereign sanctuary around around the OTO and its leadership. They were already doing that, but he's the one to actually talk about Cagliostro this way and bring it all together. And the reason why that's interesting is because today's Memphis Museums quite readily talk about, you know, Cagliostro's quarantine as, as internal alchemy. They all say, oh no, you know, the white drops, the red drops, it's all very symbolic and internal. And when they um, come across sometimes Steiner, the story the Italian Memphis Mystery groups give today is that, you know, Steiner got it maybe from Roy's and Roy's got it from Yaka, who was the head of this Memphis Mystery lineage. He obviously got it from Italy. So the, the Italians claim this stuff all goes back to Italy. Um, but when they're talking about this, you know, when they, when they share all these ideas and it's on websites in Italian, Memphis, Memphis Mystery and websites, uh, what they didn't know is that Steiner is actually working all this through the Kerning context and he's pulling this out of the Kerning path. And um, the reason why I credit Steiner, Steiner with this, he's the first reference, first of all, but we see out of the OTO and Steiner who are working, you know, the Egyptian rite, all of a sudden, you know, um, the Belgian Memphis Mysterium and other Memphis Mysteriums later start talking about the Arcana Arcanorum. And more and more the story grows, and more and more this whole Cagliostro thing becomes internal alchemy. So. I really put that back to Steiner, and there is nothing before that, because if you really read Cagliostro stuff, he's, his morale regeneration is in, like the upper melon, you're doing a magical operation. And his, you know, alchemical quarantine is, is literally lab alchemy and, and inducing tinctures and stuff. So um, it's really Steiner who evolved it and, and brought Kerning into the mix. And fast forward 100 years, you know, a lot of Memphis Mysteriums today who have Arcanas, or Arcana Arcanorum, the great secret of secrets. They're all practicing internal alchemies. And um, in my book, I'm able to identify how those all actually go back to Kerning as well, yeah. you know, and, and maybe burst the bubble for some of the so-called, you know, um, traditional histories where it's meant to go back to other sources, but it is quite clearly, you know, based on Kerning. That's fascinating, that's fascinating. Hi everyone, this is part one. And this episode will be continued as we had to end a bit early due to some family stuff Deacon John had to attend to. In the show notes, check out the links for the past shows with Sam, our Rosicrucian playlist, the Panzofus homepage, and the link to buy your copy of Letters on the Royal Art. As always, thanks for checking out Talk Gnosis and thanks to Sam and Ian for coming on the show and for all the great work they're doing.